much. And uh, Mike, you set me up really great because this is exactly the theme I'm going to be discussing. I think anyone who spends time in Africa can't help but notice over the past 15 years the immense influence, not only of China, but also Malaysia, Korea. Um, and I think broadly that's, that's a very good thing. Uh, I was just in Tanzania last week. The second five-year development plan they've just released has a lot of influences from Malaysia and China in it. I was in Rwanda before that, and Paul Kagame is very clear that Singapore is his role model. Um, and I think that this is that, that 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 this is actually caused me to to wonder why the developmental state. This I can see the attraction of it for Africa, but. I wonder why it hasn't happened yet. In other words, why does the developmental state happen in Southeast Asia and not in Africa? And it may seem like a facile question to you, but if you look at economic, um, if you look at, at, at per capita GDP in Sub-Saharan Africa and Asia in 1960, you'll see that Africa, by and large, was a lot wealthier than South Asia and Southeast Asia in terms of per capita output. You see countries like Zambia and Sudan and Senegal doing much better in per capita output than, say, Vietnam or Thailand, China, Pakistan, Indonesia, not to mention Malaysia. But then you look at 2015, and there's been a huge divergence there. Sub-Saharan Africa really lagging behind. And you see these large here, you can see China, Malaysia, making huge strides compared to where they were in the 1960s. I think this is a story we all know very well. But if you look at the arguments that scholars tend to make about why poverty is so persistent in Africa, you get issues like colonialism, artificial multi-ethnic states, poor tropical geography, bad governance, abundant natural resources, and prone to conflict. But if you look at Southeast Asia broadly over the past five decades, you see the same trends. Countries like Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam can all have these, have these characteristics in their recent history. So it seems to me that all of these arguments for lack of economic development in Africa don't hold all that well outside the region. And this is what really got me wondering about what is the roots of the divergence? Why do we get this rapid growth in Southeast Asia in the past five or six decades compared to Africa, which is just stagnated? Now, there's been a lot of literature on this. If, I mean, I know this sounds like, okay, I've read this Robert Wade, and I've read all about the developmental state and Chalmers Johnson. I agree with all of that. We know a lot about what these governments did. We know about rural bias. We know about a focus on human capital. We know a focus on infrastructure. But that doesn't tell us a lot about why they did it and why you see so many governments in Southeast Asia making similar decisions in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, while in Africa they're making totally opposite decisions. And these are countries that all got independence at about the same point in time from a roughly similar set of colonizers. I'm going to make, to use Mike's term, a provocative argument that development is largely a historical contingency. And this may sound from some, now we're academics, we work in theory, and we have big theoretical constructs. I have thought about this and read about this and looked at what a lot of other people have said. And it seems to me that the history, and especially the way that World War II and the Cold War affected East Asia and Southeast Asia in a very different way than it focused than it led in sub-Saharan Africa. You can see that quote there by Richard Stubbs, that the economically successful states of Southeast and East Asia, societies were weak and institutional states became strong and autonomous. The reasons for this were related to a series of wars in the region. Now, maybe you're not convinced by the war argument, and I can't do that in two minutes, but I will 
tell you irrefutably that war and poverty reduction in Asia are very closely linked. And the argument of this is the, is the Green Revolution. For those of you who work on Africa, we always ask, why has there been no Green Revolution in Africa? Why is there no Green Revolution in Africa? And my answer to that is because the United States government has never worried about communist insurgencies in sub-Saharan Africa. Because if you look at the amount of funding, you can see wherever communism goes, hunger follows. You see USAID talking about the Green Revolution as opposed to a Red Revolution. The Green Revolution was a statement of foreign policy, that this is about bringing people up and, the, and, and communism is about putting people down. Um, there you can see that all of the, there was no technological breakthrough in the Green Revolution. All the technologies were known. It was that the US government was willing to spend hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars a year, subsidizing all of these inputs and was never willing to do that in Africa. By contrast, if you look at independence in Africa, it looks a lot less transformative than in, than in Southeast Asia. Um, scholars like Mamou Madami and um, Jeffrey Herbst have done a lot of research into this, and they show how post-colonial governments in Africa actually kept a lot of the colonial structures of government in Africa, allowing chiefs to allocate land, continued urban bias, very limited state presence outside of um, outside of urban areas, and this is the exact opposite of what a rural development poverty reduction through agricultural strategy would look like. And the exception that proves the rule here is South Africa. And the reason is because South Africa focus had the most intense period of, of colonization. You might call it settler occupation. And the only way that 10% of the population could govern 90% of the population against their will was by delving deep into these communities, building the infrastructure, building the intelligence networks. And that actually created a very strong state in South Africa. And it was a form of colonization unlike any that you saw in any other of the of the countries in Africa where colonization was a much lighter touch. So what's my conclusion here? Well, I don't know if it's a great conclusion, but one thing, two, two points stick out to me is that many of the theories that we have for poverty or for development in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa don't exist outside the region. So unless we're going to go back to the Africa dummy variable, it seems to me we need to update a lot of these theories. <laughs> But the second question, the second point, is why does the developmental state not travel to Africa? And I think for people who are thinking about going into the development field, this is a harder question for us to answer because we see governments that want to actively apply this framework to themselves, and the question is how will they be able to do so? And it seems to me that the important point here is that independence was not transformational in sub-Saharan Africa the way it was in Southeast Asia. And that the interests opposed to development in Africa uh, still are largely there. And those sort of forces that were wiped out during the conflicts from the 1940s to the 1970s and allowed the state to basically um, uh, put to be the driver of development, that hasn't happened quite yet in Africa. And I'll give one example of this. There's a very large Swedish investor called Eco Energy. It wants to come in with $500 million to provide ethanol in Tanzania. And the government is supportive of this, sort of, and these guys have dropped in $40, $50 million uh, already and have yet to produce a single liter of ethanol. And if you look behind the reason for that is because the local community is very reluctant to want to give up its land and is able to pressure the government saying the land belongs to the community, to the people, and the, if the government wants to bring a foreign investor in, then he has to compensate the community. And these types of microtransactions where the state is going to be able to come in and say, yes, that we're going to be able to do this investment and the state is on top of, and directing the uh, development agenda hasn't happened yet 
for reasons, I think, related to lack of transformation during independence. Uh, and I think this is going to be a challenge for many governments in Africa. And I'll conclude by saying, if you see the countries that are most able to apply the developmental state framework in sub-Saharan Africa effectively, Ethiopia and Rwanda, I think it's no coincidence that this only happened following a conflict where these societal forces able to resist this top-down developmental state were unable to resist it. Uh, thank you very much.